Willie, very much indeed. Let me just uh, reiterate uh, Willie's welcome. It's so encouraging to have you here, and uh, thanks especially to those who've come such a long way, some of you, to be with us here today. Um, I want to do two things in this introductory session. Uh, the first and perhaps most obvious one is we cover the opportunity to say a little bit about uh, developments in our course here. Um, We've been running both Cornhill and the pastor's training course that follows on for that for some years now. Cornhill is in its 12th year, I think, and the pastor's training course in its 7th. Um, over the last year, there have been some new developments in what we're doing, uh, which uh, have been uh, designed to shape the program into a more comprehensive uh, training package for ministry. And... Uh, We'd love the opportunity to say something about that to you. You've been given the, uh, the prospectus for the uh, pastor's training course and the diploma in ministry. And uh, some of what I'll be um, uh, doing in this session is to refer to bits of that. But there's a lot more detail there that you might like to take away and peruse at your leisure. And uh, we hope to have time for questions at the end as well. So uh, please feel free to ask any questions that come up. Uh, in particular, over the last year, we've um, uh, adopted more and are adopting more of the Third Millennium uh, Ministries uh, online uh, program uh, into what we do in the pastor's training course and at Cornhill uh, to help join the whole thing up. And we'll be saying a little bit more uh, about that as we go through. However, before talking about the course and what we're doing here, uh, I want to spend a few minutes just setting what we're trying to do in the context of what's going on uh, in the nation. And I want to begin by saying, therefore, something about the massive, overwhelming gospel need in Scotland now. Um, if you work here, you are, of course, all the time aware of that need, even at a kind of subliminal level. Uh, day by day, doesn't your work in your church ministry situation seem sometimes painfully small and slow and difficult? On the other hand, uh, we are all aware, aren't we, of the growing ignorance about Christian things, culture-wide, and hostility. In Scotland, one gets the impression almost that people have been inoculated against the Lord Jesus. Um, looking at some hard data more than confirms that feeling of things aren't going all that well. Some 6% of Scottish people are regulars in church, which doesn't sound all that bad, actually. 6% is a good number, uh, until you realise that 40% of those 6% are over 65 which is twice the na national average of people over 65. Two-thirds of Scottish people never go to church. 52% say they have no particular religious affiliation. At the turn of the century, 17 years ago, that was 40%, 40 to 52. It's estimated that by 2020 there will be 4,600 churches in Scotland, which is a small increase on the numbers today. Again, that doesn't sound too bad. One church for every 1,150 people in the nation doesn't sound too bad. Well, not too bad. <laughs> Until one thinks that church in that research refers to anything that might be recognized as Christian. Absolutely anything. Take a little mental wander through the centres and suburbs and small towns of Scotland, the places where you live, and think to yourself as you mentally pass the buildings in the street, what proportion of the churches you walk past would be a church where if someone were to walk in desperate to know about the Christian message, they would have a reasonable chance of hearing the truth in such a way that they might be converted. Just think about that. What proportion of those churches? Would it be a half or a quarter? A fifth would be one church for every 
5,750 people in the nation, a tenth would be one church for every 11,500 people in the nation, an altogether more daunting prospect. Brothers, there is a great job to be done here, a really big job. Even if one were only thinking about maintaining the status quo in our churches, the job would be huge. The average age of a church minister in Scotland is 57. The average age is 57. However, we are not in the maintenance business. We're not in that business. We are in the business of making disciples of all nations. That's the business the Lord Jesus has given us. The task in front of us in Scotland today is not the maintenance of anything or even the revitalization of a denomination or two. What is necessary, given the Lord's command and the state of things, is the complete re-evangelization of the nation. Nothing less than that is necessary. Nothing less than that as an aim is necessary for Scotland. And that's just thinking about Scotland. We could so easily become nationally parochial, couldn't we? And not think about the world beyond. How do we respond to that need? I think faced with the hugeness of the task and the smallness of the present reality, it's all too easy to go into maintenance mode rather than mission mode, to kind of pull up the drawbridge and strengthen the defences and try and keep things going. In the first half of the AD 60s, Paul wrote from his own very difficult situation in prison in Rome to his colleague Timothy facing another very difficult situation in the church in Ephesus. Be strengthened by the grace that's in Christ Jesus. Get back to the work. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who'll be able to teach others also. It is evident from 1 and 2 Timothy that Paul thinks that Timothy, a hugely experienced and brilliantly trained gospel worker, is at least in some danger of pressing his foot on the soft pedal, slightly retreating from the difficulty. Paul wants him not just to get back to the work, but notice to equip others to do the work that he is currently finding it so hard to do. Four generations are in view in this imperative. (coughs) You, me, the faithfuls that you will teach and those that they will train. Do you see? A constant uh, pattern of training. This instruction indicates two things at the very least. First, that the training of gospel workers is important enough to make it to the top of Paul's agenda, even at the most difficult times for him and for his colleague. Second, that a core part of the work of the ordinary gospel worker, a core part of that work, is not merely teaching people, not merely pastoring churches, but training people for ministry who will also be able to train others. In other words, the training of trainers for ministry is a core part of the pastor's work. If we're in ministry, a core part of our job is training people to do gospel ministry who will train others to do gospel ministry when it's hard to do it, which it is at the moment, isn't it? It is hard to do it. Paul responds to difficult situations with a proactive training agenda. Brothers and sisters, we must do the same. We must do the same. Now, let me say a little bit, that's the background we're in here. We must do the same. We have to be active in training people. Let me say a little bit about what we're trying to do here and how that fits into the broader scheme of things nationally. And I'll be following uh, broadly the outline of the first two or three pages of the thing you've got in front of you. So if you want to have that open and uh, scribble a few things, please do feel free to do that. Um, The work we're doing here is really driven by two core convictions, which I think have two necessary implications. Let me say first, before we get to that, our big goal here 
in Cornhill is not just the training of pastors, but the emergence of growing numbers of training churches in which gospel ministry is multiplied and through which the nation can be reached. We cannot possibly re-evangelize the nation merely by pumping out gospel workers into it if that doesn't result in churches becoming locations of training. And therefore, our part here in Cornhill is to try and support the training of pastors who will not only train other pastors, but build churches in which an ongoing training culture is deeply embedded from bottom to top of church life. Um, you'll see that that's, uh, that aim is on uh, page three at the top. Let me say something about our core convictions. Two core convictions with two implications for training. Core conviction number one, that the means of gospel ministry is the prayerful teaching and preaching of the Bible in the power of the Spirit. This is the thing that must happen. Uh, it's the urgent and constant need in our churches, in our personal ministries throughout the nation. And second, that the focus of gospel ministry is the local church. The Lord has made it so that the vehicle for the gospel is the local congregation in which the truth is lived out and from which the truth is proclaimed uh, to the culture around about. Here are the two necessary implications of these. If the means of gospel ministry is the prayerful preaching and teaching of the Bible, equipping Bible preachers and teachers is absolutely essential. And second, if the local church is the focus of gospel ministry, then the local church needs to be the primary focus for ministry training. Let me say that again. The local church needs to be the primary focus for ministry training. For it is here that gospel workers are to be training others who can train others. And it is here that character is shaped and tested and sharpened and gifts are developed in the context of people who know people. Evangelicals have characteristically believed the things on the left-hand side, but not always followed through in the things on the right-hand side. We have not always been good at training and equipping preachers and teachers. We have not trained nearly enough preachers and teachers. And second, there has been a major disconnection between the bottom two boxes. What equipping we have done has often been done at a, as, at a significant distance from the local congregation. Churches have rarely been active training centers. And this has a number of serious consequences that I've listed uh, on the handout. First, local congregations have generally not recognized their responsibility to train gospel workers. Does your church view it as, we are responsible for training the next generation of workers here in this congregation? It's our responsibility along with others, of course. Ask a church, where does training happen for ministry? What will they say? Try it tomorrow morning. Where does training happen for gospel ministry? What will they say? Most of them will say, oh, over there in the college. Ask a minister, where did you train for ministry? And the answer will be, at this institution or that institution or the other institution, nearly always. And the consequences of this is that churches don't own training. And often gospel workers in churches have little confidence that they have anything to contribute to the, training, to the training of people in ministry. Because it's not where they learned what to do, uh, the thing, how to do the things they do. Second, people thinking about gospel ministry may not have been trained and tested in local church situations. So you will all have run into people who are in ministry who probably ought not to have been. Isn't that the case? 
people whose character difficulties or personalities are just too awkward. Third, it has often been the case that theological training institutions have been detached from the practice of ministry and failed to connect the things being learned in the class with what happens in the churches. Fourth, the dropout rate amongst evangelical ministers is very high in this country. Um, ask any Cornhill student, um, what's your biggest question about ministry? And many of them will say, how on earth am I going to get a ministry job? <laughs> you know, getting from where they are, I think I might want to get into full-time ministry too. Well, what on earth does that job look like? That seems like an insuperable que question for many, given the state of things here. Let me suggest to you that a far bigger question is not how can I get in, but how can I stay in and stay healthy for the long haul in ministry? For many people get in and fall out. <clears throat> And they fall out because they get exhausted and burned out or sexually compromised or just they fall out functionally because they kind of retreat to maintenance mode. Perhaps most significantly, because churches have on the whole lacked strong in-church training cultures, congregations have been poorly equipped for their work in the world. For some, church has become a kind of spectator sport where we pitch up on Sunday to watch the pastor perform. We give marks, we go home, and so on. That separation of training from church, we are desperately trying to undo here. Um, our particular goal is to try and bring these boxes together to try and make the equipping of preachers and teachers of the scriptures the core of what ministry does, the absolute essential, the big thing. And second, to try and bring further theological training just as close to the local church setting as it's possible to do. Our part in this job is to try and bring together the churches and the training institutions. We're not wanting to build a massive institution here, but rather to try and bring churches and training together. Now, um, our model for training is we're trying to bring the, uh, the student and the course and the church as closely together as possible. Um, let me say something about the shape of the course, just to finish off. Our course has three elements, uh, a core curriculum, which is the Cornhill training course, a consolidating curriculum, which is the pastor's training course, a three-year on-the-job uh, further training in theology and ministry thing that happens beyond Cornhill, and an ongoing curriculum. I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Let me say something about what I think our distinctives are. There's lots of detail on the sheet for you to, to interact with. And I'm not going to say, I'm not going to explore all that detail now, but let me say something about what I think the distinctives are of what we're doing here. I hope that will be at least in some measure helpful. First thing I'd like to say is that our core curriculum is uh, somewhat different from uh, what training institutions sometimes have. The Cornhill training course, the practical course in handling the, in handling the Bible, is the heart of what we're doing here. Um, it's not the entry-level course that gives you access to the real stuff, you know, the academic theology. Rather, it's uh, that we want uh, people trained for ministry who are thoroughly competent to bring the, the Word of God to bear on the lives of individuals and congregations so that they are transformed. We start on that, we aim to continue that all the way through the Cornhill and Pastors Training Course thing. Um, often, 
Regular seminary training has very little preaching and teaching opportunity, uh, very little development in that uh, skill and in the gift and in the character things that are needed to make that happen. We're trying to make the core thing the important thing. Second, um, we're trying to emphasize doing on the job training. Uh, the pastor's training course is designed to fit properly into a church working job. Uh, the people on PTC are expected to have done uh, the Cornhill training course and be in a, a training role in a church. And the training role is the main part of their training, being supervised by a pastor who will help them to develop. Um, they are expected to have a day a week to be able to devote to the course. A day a week during university terms and a week a term. We have three residential weeks during the course. That's a total of about 45 to 50 days of course-related study during the course of a year over a three-year period. We do not want the course to extend massively beyond that. We want the course to be manageable with a day a week study a week. Uh, we don't want students all the time to be pulled away from the work that they're doing in church in order to be writing essays and reading vast tracts of theology which they will never use or think about. Incidentally, we are not aiming to be theology light at all. More about that in a moment. But we're not meaning to distract people from ministry in order to do the theology. Part of the purpose of that day a week, regular, manageable training pattern is that we want to set people on a course of on the job learning that they continue forever in ministry. Because many people drop off the end of their theological training at the beginning of ministry and suddenly become overwhelmed by the needs and demands of church in such a way that they never learn anything new, which is one of the reasons that people fall over after five or 10 or 15 years. They get bored and disengaged. They're not stimulated to learn more. We want to start people as they mean to continue. Third, we want to major on neglected things. Uh, characteristically, historically, uh, most theological education has been Grab a bunch of people who are roughly the same, throw a curriculum at them, and test them at the end on data acquisition and recall. Those are usually not the things that make people... The lack of that is not what makes people fall over in ministry. It's not lack of information that makes people not able to continue. It's lack of character development, lack of relational competence. <coughs> they end up fighting with people, squabbling with people, being insecure and unable to relate to people and so on and so on. We are trying to make the softer, more important things right at the heart of what we aim to uh, promote during the course. So we spend a lot of time in class talking about ministry and we spend a lot of time in class talking about character and the character implications of the things that we're learning theologi theologically and so on. Um, do does this person relate well to others? Is this person on the course the sort of person you'd like to employ if you had a job in ministry to employ someone? That's, that's the end product we're aiming for. Fourth, uh, flipping the classroom. Let me say what I mean by that. Much of traditional theological education is spent, the best hours of teacher and student are spent in, in data transfer. The teacher tells the student things, and next week tells the student more things, and so on. Uh, we are trying to do something rather different from that. Students do data download on their home study days. The next week, the classroom time, the bulk of classroom time is spent in, in processing the implications of the things that they've learned. Have you understood that? Well, if you have, why does that matter? How might that impact on church life and personal life and ministry life and so on? We have found this to be an enormously fruitful, an enormously fruitful pattern of uh, learning. We get very quickly from the things that people read and think about to the ministry implications of things. And because people are constantly in the job and training alongside the job, that kind of join up has multiplied. 
very productive. Flexibility. Because the classroom does not have a rigid program of we must keep the data transfer up, we have lots of flexibility to discuss what students need to discuss, the questions they have, the ministry issues that they're encountering in their ministry situations, and so on. Having a resource like Third Millennium, uh, the Third Millennium stuff also gives us massive, massive flexibility. We are plugging uh, some units of the Third Millennium material into the core things that we do in Cornhill and in Pastors Training Course, but we also have a huge range of other curriculum material that if students have time and aptitude and energy, they can go to. It's very flexible. Uh, and finally, uh, sorry, f f penultimately, accessibility. We're trying to uh, make the course useful for a range of people, people who are very well educated and people who are not very well educated. If the nation is going to be re-evangelized, we need a huge range of really competent gospel workers, not an educationally constrained ra range of people who are not really able to, eat, to reach all sorts of different communities. And finally, we've designed the course to, that, so that it has an open door. That is to say, when you leave the formal part of the course, the door is always open to come back in. We've just had a pastor's training, group, uh, uh, training course uh, residential week in which we had the current students and a whole bunch of former students coming back to carry on their continuing education and a whole bunch of people who are thinking about the course uh, coming along to check it out and see what it looks like. So at the moment, we, usually there have been somewhere between five and ten people on the course at any one time. It rolls around in modules. Uh, we have six on the course at the moment, uh, but we had 20, 20, 20 plus in the room. Uh, people who've been on the course and are coming back. One of the things we want to do through that open door is not only help people to keep learning down the line, but help to develop a, a supportive ministry community. People who know and trust one another will be able to keep one another going longer term. I hope that a little bit then about our distinctives. I think my time is gone really. Um, there will be time for questions at the end about any of the detail that you want to ask about. I hope that's been of some use in getting you inside the kind of things we're trying to do. But let me say again, our ultimate goal is not the training of pastors just, but rather the growing emer emergence of growing numbers of training churches in which gospel ministry is multiplied in church and through church and through which the nation can be reached. The job we have is a huge one. It is not going to happen unless the churches become places where active people are actively trained and equipped for ministry. And we're trying to support that happening. Brilliant.